Today's film is The Crowd Roars from 1932, directed by Howard Hawks, which, who was a powerhouse in Hollywood for a very long time. Hawks was born at the end of the 19th century, died in the 1970s, and for about 54 years he was active, but he was especially productive during the 1930s and 40s when he produced films, usually commercial films, not artistic features, but films with the biggest stars from the era. James Cagney, that you see as the protagonist in this film, or Catherine Hepburn, or Harry Grant, etc. It's also a curious case of a director who, after devoting a film that came out in 1932 to sports racing, 40 years later, in the early 1960s, produced and directed another film about car racing, 7,000 RPMs, although nowhere as good or full of stars as this one. In this film, at the very beginning, before the credits, we see James Cagney playing the part of Joe Greer, driving this car to victory at Indianapolis after narrowly missing at the very last lap a car that has an accident. Because drama is infused in this representation of racing. However, overall, as I'll say in a moment after illustrating the plot, overall this film is quite different in its view of car racing from the film we saw last week, Le Mans, with Steve McQueen from 1971. In Le Mans, you find drivers who are rather dull in real life and only feel fulfilled and satisfied when they are driving the race car at speed, even during such a prolonged effort like as the 24 hour of Le Mans. So without the car, they feel less of a man. In here, you find a film that is focusing very closely on the world and the lifestyle of car racing. However, the film is mostly about the drama occurring in the personal lives of the protagonists and about their inability to reconcile their addiction to speed and to the thrill of racing with the real values, the values accepted by society, such as love in a long relationship in a committed relationship, family, etc. So after the credits which also show the names of eight famous car drivers from the period who collaborated in the film, although most of them are shown at the very end, uh, the conclusion is uh, it takes place during the 500 miles of Indianapolis race. After the credits, we are inside a train car. This train car it is taken, this car and another car owned and managed by Joe Greer to his hometown. Together with him, we see the chief mechanic, Spat Connors, who's also his relief driver. A relief driver was someone who could take the steering wheel if the driver of a car uh, was too tired to continue, which could happen, or was hurt or injured. Take, for example, the 500 miles of Indianapolis. Uh, when, when the track was made with bricks, Right now, they only kept one stripe of bricks at the start line. The vibrations uh, transmitted to the wheel were such 
that some drivers experience serious problems with their hands by the end of the race. So if for one reason or the other, a driver could not complete the, um, the race, another reason might be intoxication from the gases coming from the engine because those engines were not as uh, sealed or filtered as an engine can be these days, the relief driver could jump in. The rules allow the second driver to take the steering wheel and bring the car to the end of the race. In fact, we'll see through the film that Spad is not just the relief driver, he's often driving the second car of this team. We're in 1931, when we see the first scene, we know we can gather from uh, a, a clue uh, left later on that it is November of 1931. And as I said, the train is taking Joe Greer to his hometown that he hasn't visited in four years, even though he has a family, he has a father, and he has a brother. Keep in mind this theme of reconciling your focus, your obsession with racing with family values. And as it happens in plenty of films from this era, we often see headlines that clarify some details in the story. In this case, before, right before we see the, the outside of the train, we see a headline from this newspaper that the baggage man, that's what the sign says, the label says on his hat, is reading. And this headline says, great champion Joe Greer coming back uh, to his hometown after his Indy victory, coming there to compete with local champ. And the local champ is in fact his brother. So at some point, the baggage man will look at the others so that everyone in the audience in the theater can make the connection between the headline, the paper he's reading, and through him and his gaze moving to, the, to them, understanding that, that they're talking about them. So they're working on the car, the car engine is running inside the train car, and at some point you see clouds of smoke enveloping the baggage man. So Joe Greer goes home, finally, and he's kind of excited. Before he arrives to destination, Joe leaves the car, the train car where the, his racing automobile is, and goes to his private cabin. In his private cabin, he finds Lee. Lee is Joe's companion. So they have a relationship, but this relationship is failing to develop in a long-term relationship. And they have a conversation. Lee has two problems. One is that she's not supposed to get out of the, get off the train because for some reason, Joe doesn't want to introduce Lee, his companion, to his family and to the home folks to the people of his town. So she will continue and go home, and home for Lee is an apartment inside a hotel in Los Angeles, California, and Joe promises that he will join her soon. The other issue weighing heavily on Lee, interpreted beautifully by Aunt Dvorak, who was uh, a, a really great actress from the period underutilized. Her career fizzled uh, by, by the early 1930s. The other problem is that he doesn't want to put a ring on her. And he knows that and he says he loves her, but he doesn't want to. And later we understand the reasons. Later he will explain the reasons. The reasons being that since he's uh, facing death, with every race, it wouldn't be fair. This would not be a good foundation for a long-term relationship, let alone a family. However, as I said, he promises that he loves her and that they'll spend more time together because they're almost at the end of the season. 
we see here for the first time and then several times throughout the movie that Joe is drinking, takes out this rather substantial flask and drinks from the silver cap while they're talking. And she says, she says two things. One, she says, why are you doing this? Why are you racing? And, and that's where the title comes into play. And then this is mentioned, the phrase, the crowd roars is mentioned twice again in the film. The crowd goes to see a race hoping to see a dramatic accident, hoping to see blood, hoping to see death. And she's saying there is no real amount of money or uh, no kind of triumph that justifies taking risks as much as he does. But the implied argument is there is no reason to sacrifice your the real values for a member of society, meaning a family, for example, having a family. And we'll see later how Joe is critical of his relief driver, Spad, because Spad is not only married, but he has a kid. And Joe believes that this is unfair to the kid. So they have this kind of an argument, even though they leave each other in good terms, but we know that Lee is unhappy. And it's also clear that Lee, Lee says, this was fine at the beginning of our relationship. This was enough for me, being together. But now, it's not enough, right? So, and this is part of another theme that uh, um, is connected to the representation of the female characters in this film. There are two uh, prominent characters and a couple of secondary characters, but the two prominent female characters are Lee, Joe's companion, and Anne, or Annie, who is Lee's best friend and who will become the fiancé and then the wife of Joe's brother, Eddie, kid brother, the younger brother, Eddie. And that theme in the representation of these female, these are modern women. Women who enjoyed a life of luxury. You can say, you will see how grandiose her hotel apartment is. But it's clear from the conversation that a conversation that will take place between Lee and Anne, her friend, that they can afford this lifestyle not because they're working, but because they are in relationships with men who can pay for this kind of lifestyle. And Anne in particular, whereas Lee by this time has made the jump, has jumped to the next stage in life where she wants to, she, she is in love with Joe. She's not exploiting Joe's fame and success and money. And it's clear from the film that he is making a lot of money with race prizes. But she, she wants to be a wife, she wants to be a mother. Whereas Anne is not really in love with these men she's seeing. Uh, she likes them, but she likes, it, likes them even more because they uh, are, are generous with, with her. Okay, so we have two female characters that in terms of social role models represent a dubious kind of morality. However, they're transitioning. First, Lee will transition to the position of an honorable woman committed in a relationship, in love, caring for their men and, and supporting their efforts in a career. These are the standards of the time, right? The, 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 the woman in an ancillary role, in a supportive role in the marriage. But it's the men in, in this film that are not transitioning as quickly, especially Joe. It's Joe who's not ready to be a husband, the husband she deserves until the end of the movie, until she goes through a process of cleansing and redemption, including giving up on alcohol. Okay. So they leave each other in good terms, but Lee is, is not happy uh, and, and somewhat anxious. She feels that something is about to happen, but it's not good at all. 
and Joe gets out, gets out the train, Eddie comes to greet him, runs through the crowd to greet his big brother, who's a hero for him. And Joe doesn't even recognize his brother because it's been four years, because they've been so out of touch. And, and this complements the dialogue between Lee and, and Joe in the train, right? You understand that he's not ready to embrace the values of being part of a family because his own family is not being treated fairly by him. And of course, we understand soon how we, all the cars are brought to Pop Greer's garage, the garage, the shop, the mechanics shop run by Joe, Joe's father. And there we understand uh, uh, what had been already hinted through the headlines that Eddie is now into racing, that he's been racing all summer. It's November, he's been racing all summer in minor leagues, in, in secondary races and tracks. And Eddie would like to be mentored, would like to be taken by his big brother on a tour to uh, become a real professional driver. His father and Eddie have worked on this car, which will run in the next day's race against his big brother. And, and although not as sophisticated uh, as Joe's brother, uh, we will see that it's still a very fast car. And this is Joe's father, and this is Eddie, of course, this is Joe, and that is Spad, who's also a, a, the best friend of Eddie. And this is the sign, plenty of text in this sound movies. Silent films had plenty of text, but even the first sound movies had plenty of text that took the, carried the narrative uh, on. Right in here, you can see that Joe Greer's Automobile Club of America Championship and in Indianapolis winner is, is racing against Eddie Greer, the local champion. And Eddie's name is even bigger than Joe's name. So you have a hint of this, of the ensuing competition, right? That will uh, happen through uh, much of the film. And, and notice how the mise-en-scene, the frame is composed, right? You have the shadow of a will to understand, to make you, to remind you as a viewer that we're inside a garage, that this is not uh, something that um, is, is disconnected from their focus and work. During a race, there are two uh, races that take place during the same day. Uh, during the first race, Joe and Spud will drive out of the truck and into uh, a hen house. Uh, during the second race, uh, while Eddie, while Joe is winning, the, the older brother, Eddie, the younger brother, will have an accident. Joe is very concerned, he slows down the car, go and checks on his brother, Eddie, is fine. However, here we have the twist that brings on the plot, the story of the film. Joe decides to offer Eddie. Joe is apparently very impressed with Eddie's style. So he first gives him tips on how to drive or how to take the turns. And then Joe offers him a seat on the second car. Uh, so the car that during this race was driven by Spad becomes Eddie's car and this means that, of course, Joe is not coming home to Lee. Joe is extending his tour, going to uh, participate at more races together with his brother. A month later, this is, uh, this is the message, uh, the telegram from Ed, uh, Joe to Lee where he says that he's not coming home on that Monday, but he's extended the tour by another month. It's November 10th, 
so you know that it's November at the beginning of the film, 1931. And there will be another telegram that says, December reads December 15, where it says that Joe is coming home to Los Angeles finally. This is Anne, uh, the best friend of Lee. And they're back, they're both in Los Angeles, they live in apartments inside the same hotel, and of course it's a, all a studio stage, right? It's all fake, not, not a real building. Uh, and Anne is, is warning Lee. Anne represents at this point a different point of view. She says, well, Joe is not treating you well. And you are sacrificing your life. You're not going out. You're not seeing other men. You're staying in this hotel having a boring time. And, and Anne will say, I'm not like that. I'm not so attached to any man, and I want to have a good time, and I'll uh, go out with men who can give me, grant me that, right? Finally, it's December, it's almost Christmas, Joe comes back to Los Angeles with his brother. However, when Lee is expecting Joe to spend time with her finally, and first of all to go home to their apartment in the hotel in Los Angeles, Joe says, well, he says two things. First of all, we cannot be seen by my brother. He doesn't know we have a relationship. And the reason why Joe doesn't want to make his relationship with Lee public is that he has been telling his brother that a race driver should not have a long-term relationship with a woman because those two things are incompatible long-term relationships family and their lifestyle and career so he doesn't want to give the bad example by being seen in a relationship himself and then uh, right down there he says go home because i'm going to the shop i'm going to the garage to work on the car with my brother so Racing takes first place. And he says, we, since we cannot be seen together, I've taken another apartment in the same hotel. So, with, with my brother. So, you see that their relationship is crumbling. Of course, Lee is very, very worried. It's off-season. They're simply working. The two brothers are working on their cars for the next season. And one day, uh, Eddie the younger brother, uh, comes and, and visits Lee and Anne in their apartment. Uh, Joe is not there, so to kill some time, Eddie shows up. And Eddie would like to have a good time. He's young, so he sees plenty of drinks. You see all the bottles. So he, he claims he wants a drink. And they give one. He's also very taken by the legs of Anne. And keep in mind that this is a pre-code Hollywood film. The code was established a couple of years later in Hollywood and it dictated how much skin you can show, what kind of scandalous or promiscuous situation you can include in a movie. This is what, for example, made it so that often during the 1930s and even 40s, sometimes 1950s, you see even married couples sleeping in separate beds in their bedroom. This was part of the Hollywood code because there shouldn't be any suggestion that married couple have sex, right? They're, they're physically separate from, from each other. So during this conversation, and it's, it's, it's not very pleasant to Eddie because she is mad at Eddie's brother, Joe, because her friend Lee is suffering because of that. And Lee is, is, as usual, more agreeable, more affectionate. Now, during this scene, Joe comes back. He's surprised to find his brother there, and he sees his brother in the company of women that have dubious morality and they're showing their legs, and he's drinking. So he breaks up with Lee. 
He says, this is exactly what I wanted to avoid for my brother, to uh, go out with women, to establish a relationship, to be drinking, uh, etc. And, and of course, we know that Joe himself is drinking. In fact, he has a problem with alcohol. It's a borderline alcoholic. But they break up. Uh, and Lee is, is destroyed by this so such an unfair decision. And she feels that he is still in love with her, but he, he has these this rules imposed. Look at the very theatrical backgrounds, right? And also, during, throughout these scenes, it's a very theatrical setup altogether, as you would see on the stage with characters coming in through the doors, exiting the doors, the same you would see in there. And also, look at the elevation of the rooms. You never see the ceilings, and there is no ceiling, probably, the same way that in a theater you would see the inside of a room, but you never see the ceiling. Also, there is a, you may notice, it's still pretty much the style of most films, but especially in these films, you see the cinematic style uh, that uh, uh, relies on a certain fixity, a certain uh, stiffness of the characters. They say the actor will walk, take a position, and then maintain that position without moving their body or even their shoulder while they're uh, expressing their lines, acting out their lines, the movement is confined to the face. And this is still the style because you don't want to create too much notion, motion. Um, you, you want the attention of the viewer focus on the essential, not the body movement. This is very true of a lot of TV. A lot of anchor men have, have a, a severe stiffness to their body. They're, they're expressing something through their face, but they're, they're keeping their torso rigidly anchored to the desk. So Anne, clearly, when she learns that Lee has been left, abandoned, deserted by Joe, is very angry, and she says, I have an idea. He should suffer the same way you suffered. I'll go visit Anne says, this, these are Anne Lab, Anne's legs, and this is Eddie, the younger brother. I'll go visit Eddie, I'll seduce him, and I'll provoke a breakup between the brothers. I'll cause the kind of situation that Joe wanted to avoid when he left you, so he'll suffer in turn. And so she goes there and, and presents herself, right? E even though this skirt is coming down very low, this is seduction. This is being sexy for the standards of the time. And on top of that, you have Eddie underneath the car with uh, uh, first seat, first row view of her legs. And so uh, there is flirting among them, but this will develop into a real relationship. And Eddie, unlike his brother Joe, is not afraid of committing to this long-term relationship, but eventually they will get married. And Anne will be the perfect wife, loving and caring, supporting his career, while the same thing cannot be happening between Joe and Lee, because Lee has redeemed herself. She's not a tramp anymore. But Joe is drinking. Joe is not valuing family and friends as much as an honorable member of society should. So later on, still in the apartments, we see Spad, Joe's friend and co-pilot, co-driver, come to visit Lee and he says, I'm worried, I'm worried about you, I'm worried about Joe. He's worried about Joe because Joe is drinking again, a lot. And worried about her because uh, Joe will soon enough know about the relationship between Anne and Eddie and will be angry at all of them. So Lee goes over to her friend's apartment. They're all 
in the same corridor, and the corridor itself is half this, half the width of, of this classroom, right? Everything is huge on these studio sets. Um, so she goes and visits Anne, and you see her like this, but it's a good kind of suffering or pain. She's like that because she has realized that she's in love, that she has caught the bag badly, that she's badly in love, that she cannot live without, go back to her lifestyle, live without a committed, being in a committed relationship with Eddie. And Anne has come to warn her that Joe is coming and, and Joe will try to uh, break up, break this relationship between Anne and Eddie. And this in fact happens. Eddie comes in, is clearly high, half drunk, and he, he attacks Anne's morality. He says, not only you shouldn't be with my brother, but what will my brother do when he learns that you are with another man? And she says, no, no, I left the other man. Because again, she has abandoned the tramp's lifestyle. She had, doesn't have any sugar daddies, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and Eddie and Joe, uh, grows angrier, but Eddie comes in, and Eddie is in love with Anne. So Eddie trusts Anne. Joe is unable to trust anyone, no, neither Lee nor his brother, uh, or uh, certainly nor um, his brother's fiance. And so you see, everything is very clear. Everything is laid out visually in front of you in very clear terms. You see Eddie inserting himself to protect Anne from Joe's attack. He has taken his side. He is committed. Whereas Joe is growing isolated, disconnected from everyone else, right? He's not so close to Spad, who's worried about him, not close to his father, etc., etc. So we get to the next race. We see Joe drinking before the race. This is a race in Phoenix at a racetrack called Ascot. And Spad is looking at him and is worried, but he cannot say anything because Joe doesn't accept this kind of advice or recommendation. And at this point, Joe has fired his brother because he didn't want his brother to be in a relationship. So he says, okay, you, you choose her, go find another car. And it's a challenge, it's a dare. But his brother, manages to find a car and a fast car for this race. Hmm. So, so and Spad is there, a lot of other drivers are there. Now Spad, whenever he raced, he had a lucky charm. The lucky charm were his son's shoes when he was a baby. And you will see a scene in which he looks for it in his pockets, then pulls out his shoes and puts them carefully underneath his seat in the race car. But in this frame, the hands you see here are not Spud's hands. These are a mechanic's hands. A mechanic from their team realizes that Spud has forgotten his lucky charm. And guess what? Will Spud die or survive the race? If you guessed he survived, you're wrong because everything is very in your face, right? Nothing is so subtle. So what happens? The younger brother, Eddie, takes the lead in his black car. And Eddie's so angry. Angry because everything is falling apart. His brother, who has not followed his recommendation, is winning, in his, is in a committed relationship. So Eddie wants more than anything to pass his brother at all costs meaning taking risks he shouldn't be taken in driving against his, father, his brother. Spad understands that. He understands the violent dynamic and he inserts his car in second place, trying to stop, trying to block Joe from passing and then attacking his brother. And this is Eddie who takes it up with Spad, his friend, since he cannot uh, get through and get through his brother's car, he pushes uh, with his car uh, Spud's car. And you see all the sparks, right? Uh, 
and from these parts, a fire will start. So this is Spad's car bursting into flames and Spad will die horribly, burned to a crisp. And I'm saying that because what happens later is part of the drama. This is not exactly a comedy. You can call it dramedy because of the amount. There, is some, there are light scenes, but there is quite a bit of drama. When Joe and the other drivers are driving around, they can smell the flesh of uh, uh, Joe, uh, uh, Spad, sorry, burning. And if this was not clear enough, they put in another short clip where another driver stops the car at the pit stops and they say, what is it? Is the car broken? And he says, no, 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 it's spot. I cannot do another lap smelling what I'm smelling from uh, the burning of the body of spot. Eddie continues, but then he himself has to stop the car. Eddie finally realizes the extent of his faults and mistakes. And this becomes the turning point where he, as a character, can finally become more honorable, a mature man, someone ready to re-enter society and a committed relationship. And doing that with no expectations, he will get his success back. Right, because you've re-established the right hierarchy, society, family, racing. So he contemplates the flames, he realizes that his rage caused the death of his friend in such a horrible fashion. And of course, remember that uh, Spad's dying, Spad dying leaves a wife, a young wife, and a very young kid. And we don't hear about Joe again for a while. We see the house, not inside a hotel. It's a real house, a family house in Los Angeles. Um, one of those houses with a five digit number, right? You know these boulevards in Los Angeles that are long 10 or 15 miles. And there is a ring on uh, Anne's end. Uh, Anne's Finger. And uh, so she's become an honorable woman. They're in a relationship. He's being successful. They love each other. They support each other. And uh, Lee comes in uh, to visit Anne. And uh, Lee uh, has not had any more relationships. And exactly for that reason, she's now impoverished. Because the earlier other men and then Joe himself were supporting uh, her lifestyle, nice, very nice apartment in a hotel, etc. Now she's so poor that she says, I've come here to borrow money from you to go to Indianapolis and see the race. Why does she want to see the race? Because she's hoping to find Joe there. Because it's such a big race, the biggest race of the year, that she hopes to find him there. And she knows and we learn that another article is shown on the screen that Joe has been racing the minor leagues, the forgotten tracks in, in little places. So his, they all think that uh, he's taken too many risks with equipment that is not uh, kept in good shape because you need money for that and that he might soon be dying uh, by doing that. And they're worried, of course, they think that because of the remorse that he's feeling from the death of Spad, that Joe is drinking more and more, right? So they're all worried. Lee was right. In fact, we see uh, Joe coming to Indianapolis like a hobo. Right, uh, hitching a ride on a train, was typical of homeless people in films of the period, so poor that after he gets off the train, he sees 
some porters unloading supplies from the train and one of them drops an half-eaten banana and uh, Joe goes through the dirt to recover the half-eaten banana and eat the rest of it. And Joe, of course, will go to the racetrack in Indianapolis and we go from driver to driver. They all know him as a former three times champion winner of Indianapolis, asking for a ride, for a drive. He could be a, me a mechanic because uh, drivers are still riding with a mechanic by their side or a member of the crew, a relief driver. No one wants to offer him a position because they all know about his drinking problem. And this is one of the favorites of the day, a driver by the name of Arnold. And he says he offers his sympathy. And in fact, we learned that he would need a second driver. They don't have a substitute driver for their team, but cannot be anyone but Joe. And you see, of course, he's not as elegantly dressed as he was before. Uh, he's unshaven, etc. Of course, walking through the pit lane, at some point, Joe will see his brother, who's driving a brand new Duesenberg, one of the favorite cars. He's just been testing the car with great times. He's very happy, very fulfilled and satisfied. And Joe himself is happy, but he won't dare go and see his brother and talk to him, right? Because of pride, because he feels he has failed his brother, essentially. But this is part of testing, showing evidence that Joe is a new, a changed man. This is Joe from a distance, looking at his brother, smiling, then looking down, showing his contemplative, his reflection over the events that have happened during the last few months. So walking around, Joe comes by a kiosk, uh, which is kind of an open, uh, open air diner inside the track and he is recognized by the owner because Joe used to come here as a driver to eat when he was racing and uh, the owner says do you want anything and he says no I'm fine but the owner understands that he's too broke to pay and he says sit down and order whatever you want it's on me and he goes and calls the waitress but who's the waitress? It's Lee herself. So Lee goes over and, and Joe initially his, has his head on the menu and he's looking at the menu and he says, I'll have a soup and a steak and something with it. And then he raises his head and sees her Anne. And Anne is, as always, has this very affectionate, loving uh, look. Um, so they talk and she takes him to a room. She has rented a room, very poor, poorly furnished as well. And they talk. And here you see how much Joe is a changed man. He says that he stopped drinking after the night Spud died. And that he has gone through the process of feeling remorse, both for Spud and for his brother. And he says, I don't expect anyone, I could be driving, but I don't expect anyone to offer me a car. Now, does that remind you of any character from the Bible, particularly from the gospel, from one of the parables? Someone who comes back in worse conditions uh, to the people he knew with no expectations to be treated any differently because of what he did, the wrongs he committed in the past. What's his, this biblical character from the gospel? that I'm referring to. The prodigal son. The prodigal son, right? The prodigal son gets his share of the inheritance, uh, wastes the, that, ends up uh, uh, being the, the guardian of pigs, and then says, I'll go home, even if I, I'm, I'm, I can be at, at, at my house, at my father's house, treated as a servant, I'll, I'll, I'll be better. So no expectation that he'll be restored to his position as the uh, uh, son uh, and one of the heirs of the house. The same kind of morality is at play here, right? The same kind of process. No expectations. Joe doesn't expect her to love him, 
doesn't expect people to give him a car to drive, right? He has acknowledged his faults, his shortcomings, but that's the beginning of the reversal. So the race starts, car number two is the Duesenberg driven by Eddie, the younger brother, together with the mechanic. Number four is driven by Arnold with a mechanic. And uh, early on in the race, Eddie takes the lead and keeps the lead of the race for a very long time, more than 100 laps. But at some point, there is an issue with the tire from the boxes, from the pit lane, they, they hold this board uh, saying, watch the left rear tire. And in fact, uh, Eddie doesn't want to stop because if he stopped to change the tire, then he would lose the lead. The second car is two laps behind, but cars are lapping at 150 miles per hour. However, before he can stop, the rubber from the tire breaks up and violently hits his uh, left arm. We see blood, uh, the, the skin is broken, he's in pain, he cannot really drive anymore. And his mechanic is jumping in to, to help to steer and to press the pedals. So he stops and they have no substitute driver and we don't know what's going to happen. However, uh, we don't see Joe, but the announcer through the PA system of the truck says, look, the car is back in track and Eddie now is the side uh, mechanic and at the steering wheel, we have Joe Greer. So the reconciliation has been cut, but we know they're now together on this car and they're behind, right? They're trying to regain uh, the, the lead. They're in second position. They go as fast as they can. At some point, we have a car that has an accident and a fire. And this, the, the, the fire, the, the driver of the car that uh, is, is burned badly. And once again, we have this gesture signifying that he can smell the burning flesh. Has an effect, traumatic effect on Joe, who slows down. Lifts the foot from the pedal. Notice the footwear, not exactly what Lewis Hamilton or Charles Leclerc are wearing these days during a Formula One drive uh, race, right? So just Sunday school, Sunday mass shoes. So he lifts the foot from the pedal and this is his brother's Eddie's shoe, pressing it down again. Let's go, I'll help you. Now they're helping each other, they're being supportive of each other. And of course, they will uh, uh, go back to competing with the number one car. They're neck to neck. And right at the, neck, at the last lap, they have another problem with the rear front, with the right front tire. And uh, of course, they cannot stop, otherwise they would lose the race. So they continue on. They barely make it, but they win the race. And after that, this is number two, signaling that the number two car has taken the checkered flag first. And right after they've taken the lead and won the race, the rubber on the right front tire comes apart. They have an accident, but they survive. And the very last scene in the film is the two brothers in an ambulance they're happy, they're quarreling with each other, and at some point, uh, Joe learns that the, number, the, the second place car also was involved in the accident, they're in another ambulance, but they're ahead of them. So they talk to the driver on the ambulance and say, you have to use this technique to pass them. At the turn, do this, do that. And they regain the lead in their ambulance, and then they open the windows from the back and they say, okay, we'll prepare the beds for you. And, and this is the happy ending.